I'd like to say hello to everybody who's joined the webinar today. Um, by way of an introduction to myself, I decided to anticipate a few questions that you might have. And these are those questions. So what do I do? Well, I'm a Chartered Quantity Surveyor. I'm a quantum expert. I'm a um, adjudicator. And I'm also um, a company director. Who do I work for? Well, I work for Decipher Consulting predominantly in the UK and for the Hewitt Decipher Partnership um, in the UAE. What experience have I got? Well, you can probably tell from the colour of my hair, I've probably got lots of experience. Um, I've actually worked for over 35 years in the construction industry for suppliers, main contractors, subcontractors, and uh, approaching 20 years in consultancy. Um, what projects have I worked on? Uh, in my formative years, I worked on some fairly iconic projects. They were uh, things like the HSBC Bank in Hong Kong, uh, the Thames Barrier in London, um, Canberra House, the new parliamentary buildings in Australia, um, Wembley Stadium more recently. I've worked on single trade packages at the very lowest, smallest end, up to some of the iconic projects. So. I do think I've got quite a broad spread of experience. Um, how good and how relevant that is, I guess, will become apparent to you as we, as we move through the webinar. Um, what are my interests? Well, my interests now are mainly in dispute resolution. Um, as I say, I, I am acting as an adjudicator that's resolving disputes, but I'm very keen to avoid disputes and help people manage disputes. And that for me was the main reason for joining the ICCP a few years ago. I wanted to contribute and help towards professionalising uh, the management of entitlement under construction contracts. So that's a little bit about myself. Now what I would like to do is, is introduce the webinar. So I decided to ask a question of myself. And basically that is what advice can I offer practitioners? Um, so that's the, the main crux of this webinar. And most of that will come out in the practicalities. However, I think I need to set the scene with the basic concepts and principles, jurisdiction. We're going to, I'm going to talk about um, common law and civil law jurisdictions. And the contracts, I'm going to touch on uh, FIDIC, uh, JCT, and the NEC forms of contract. As I say, the practicalities will give um, day-to-day -day issue we'll deal with day-to-day -day issues and there'll be some top tips that you don't need to note because they'll all be on the final slide and then i'll get to the conclusion where i run through uh, the top tips let's start with the basic concept okay so why have notice provisions well th the main reason is to inform um, the other party that an event may happen <coughs> or in fact has indeed actually happened um, and the purpose of that is to prompt preventative or remedial action. So if we give a notice and we give a notice on time, um, whether that's for a delay event or a variation or whatever it might be, um, the sooner we give it, the better, because it does enable the other party to take some form of preventative action. That's the real purpose of notice provisions. Now, there are cynics out there who, um, who believe that notice provisions are written to act as trip hazards. And in some cases, I can sympathise with that view. But I think we all need to adopt the, the principle that the purpose of a notice is to take some preventative action as early as possible. So what events require notices? Well, there's payment notices, there's payment notices in default, um, termination notices, extension of time, loss and expense, early warning and compensation event. So really we're talking about payment, additional payment, additional time and termination. Now, condition precedent is a, a bit of a thorny issue. People seem to be unclear as to what this exactly means. Well, so what is a condition precedent? Well, a condition precedent is a condition which needs to be satisfied before an entitlement will accrue under a contract. So for example, if you, um, if you have a condition precedent clause to issue a notice by a certain time, if you don't issue the notice by that time, the notice will be time barred and you won't have an entitlement to seek additional money or time under the contract. But to be a condition precedent, 
it needs to state what the clear what the consequences are and make those very clear it doesn't actually have to say that it is a condition precedent clause um, now this got a bit confusing and this is why there's a lot of misunderstanding in the industry so i'm going to refer to the bremer handles i'm not going to pronounce the whole uh, name of the of the case but i call it the bremer handles case um, now I realise that you're all practitioners out there, so you'll have access to all the case details. You may be familiar with the case anyway, and, and the other cases that I refer to. Um, I'm not a lawyer giving a, a, a legal presentation, so I'll let you look up the, the case itself. But what came out of it was the three-point test, which defines um, what a condition precedent needs to have. Uh, and the three points are it needs to have a definite time limit or a definite constraint if it's not time. It needs to be written with strict, unequivocal language. So there needs to be no ambiguity and there needs to be clear consequences. And if all those three criteria met, are met, it is a condition precedent clause, okay? So the top tip here is, it does not need to state it as a condition precedent. It just needs to satisfy the three point test. Now there are broadly two types of notice provisions. One is mandatory and one is directory. Now in the notes there, you'll see that the first notice is written with a capital N and the second notice is written with a lowercase n. And the difference there is that the courts will enforce strictly the requirements of a capital N notice. Now a capital N notice is really reserved for formal or legal notices. And it's got a capital N because it will be defined in your contract, either in the contract data or the contract particulars, and that is where it will say what requirements need to be met to successfully issue that type of notice. Other notices will be referred in the, in the contract as notices. So this might be a payment notice, but that will usually appear with a small or lowercase n. And I choose to turn those as notifications. That enables me in my mind to separate between formal notices and notifications. Notifications of directory, and therefore the courts tend to avoid a strict interpretation where possible of the serving of those notices. The top tip here is beware because a small or lowercase n notice and notification may still be drafted as a condition precedent. So condition precedents aren't only applicable to formal notices, they can be applicable to any notice. It goes back to satisfying the three-point test in the Bremer Handles case and that is applicable to um, notifications as well as formal notices. So what constitutes a notice? Well a notice, a capital N notice, a formal notice will be defined in the contract and, and usually it will say what the address is or the legal entity that the notice has to be addressed to, um, what is the name of the person or the position that the notice has to be issued to. It will determine the delivery protocol, bearing in mind that you must get a receipt to prove that you've uh, achieved delivery, and we'll come back onto that in, in a minute. Um, it will determine a receipt protocol, and it will prescribe the minimum requirements of the notice. So the top tip here is to make sure your communication, whether it's a, a formal notice or a notification, makes it clear that this is a notice issued under the contract. Very often I see notices issued which just look like letters, general communications or even emails. They might not grab the attention of the, the receiver of the notice and if the notice is to prom pr prompt preventative action we need to grab the attention of the receiver. So I would suggest you don't issue notices as letters, it might be attached to a letter, but you issue a notice in a document that looks like it's completely different from other documents they receive with the, the word notice right at the top of the document to, uh, as I say, grab their attention. So a well-drafted notice clause will say appearance, what it is to look like. So it might even say in the contract what a, what a notice is to look like. So it will stand out from general uh, project communications. A good notice clause will state how it is to be delivered. What information is required in it in terms of the event that you're giving notification of? Who or the position that it is to be issued to? 
Now, mostly on UK projects, um, notices are to be issued to the company secretary at the registered office of, of the company. And that is because under UK law, every bid to business has to have a company secretary and have a, an address registered at company's house. So it seems sensible that those are where the formal notices need to be issued to. There is a danger that the notice won't be issued correctly if there is a name in the contract and that person has left. And we'll come on to things like that in the practicalities section of how we deal with that. Good notice clause will, will tell you what time uh, restrictions apply and when the notice is to be issued. And it will give the consequences if the, if the clause is intended to be a condition precedent clause. So the top tip here is that practitioners should comply with every requirement of the notice clause. Otherwise, you may lose your entitlement to claim under the contract. Now, I'm frequently asked the question, if we fail to send a notice of claim, or we do not send it in time, will our claim be time barred? Well, the only answer I can give is it depends. Um, and I know that's not satisfactory, but I'm now going to explain um, why it does depend. It, uh, and it principally depends on the jurisdiction. There is a very different approach in, under civil law than there is under common law. And it depends on the drafting and the construction of the contract. And I'll say this again later on, but it's always the contract that we should refer to first. What does the contract say I must do? Um, and, and that is what you must do, obviously. Um, so under civil law, there is a fundamental principle to act fairly. Now this potentially causes a problem if you envisage a situation whereby um, uh, an employer's act of prevention has delayed a contractor. Um, so the contractor finishes late and then is forced to pay liquidated damages to the employer because he got his notice in late. Um, we would have a situation where the employer would benefit from his own breach. And that is, a, is against the fundamental principle of fairness under civil law. How that exactly is untangled is unclear. And that's one of the reasons why the answer was it depends. So let's, let's look at some of the UAE civil code. So um, Article 243 says, with regard to the rights or obligations arising out of the contract, each of the contracting parties must perform that which the contract obliges him to do. 246 says the contract must be performed in accordance with its contents and in a manner consistent with the requirements of good faith. You can see now that good faith is coming into this. The person shall be li held liable for an unlawful exercise of his rights. The exercise of a right shall be unlawful if the interests desired are disproportionate to the harm that will be suffered by others. The important bit there is proportionality is coming in. So the civil law doesn't seem to accept a claim that would be disproportionate to the harm suffered. Article 318, no person may take the opportunity of another without, may take the property of another without lawful cause, and if he takes it, he must return it. 319, any person who acquires the property of another person without any disposition of ownership must return it if that property still exists or its life or the value thereof if, longer, if no longer exists unless the law otherwise provides. So this, this produces what I refer to as the unlawful dichotomy. Now the dichotomy isn't unlawful, but it's these unlawful acts which create this dichotomy between contract law and the civil law. And that is that, um, it's unlawful to have a disproportionate claim to the harm suffered. It's unlawful to have a claim that gives unjust enrichment. It's also in the civil law that a just claim never expires, but a late notice would not be regarded as acting fairly. So that there are, and then this is why I call it a dichotomy, because there are a few things to untangle there. And it all goes back to the particular circumstances. So it's the actual jurisdiction that you're in, the actual wording of the contract and the particular circumstances. So there is never a one size fits all answer to the initial question. It always will be, it depends. 
And let's look at the differences under common law. So common law is typically in the UK. Um, the view of the courts generally take the view that directory no notices are directory notice notices unless expressly um, identified as mandatory. And strict compliance will be required with conditions precedent. So we don't have this dichotomy that, that perhaps exists under, under the civil law. I want to look at a, a case that came out of Australia, the Gaymark uh, investment case. This, this set what became known as the Gaymark principle, and people will probably be aware of this now. But what came out was that liquidated damages would be unmeritorious where there had been a delay caused by the employer. And this goes back to the example that I talked about before. If there's an employer breach which delays the project, it would seem unmeritorious if the employer actually benefited from that breach. And so in this instance, um, the judge decided that the employer shouldn't. However, that principle hasn't been widely adopted in the UK. Under common law, we're at, we'd look at multiplex construction versus Honeywell, where the contractual, Mr. Justice Jackson said, the contractual terms requiring a contractor to give prompt notice of delay serve a valuable purpose. Such notice enables matters to be investigated while they are still current. Further, such notice sometimes gives the employer the opportunity to withdraw instructions when the financial consequences become apparent. But this comes back to the main purpose for a notice, and that is to enable prompt preventative action to be taken, usually by the, the employer. And that's the situation that the, uh, the common law jurisdictions are trying to maintain. Um, so you can see a big difference now between common law and um, civil law. Hence, again, the answer it depends. And I guess um, this is only my view now, this is, there's nothing further behind it, but, but I think what the UK courts are trying to get to is a, a preferred position where the contractor would gain EOT but if he was late with his notice, he wouldn't gain loss and expense. Whereas the employer would receive his project late, but he wouldn't have an entitlement to claim damages. Um, and that seems to be a fairly equitable solution, so long as the contract allows the judge to get to that position, because they will always be required to administer whatever it says in the contract. So now let's look at some of the contracts. Um, so if we look at FIDIC, um, things became a little clearer with the 2017 amendments, and they state that a notice needs to be in writing. They state that the notice needs to be signed, and they even say who has to sign it. That's usually the engineer or, or the project manager um, or whoever's identified in the contract. It also identifies that a notice stating a subclause um, should be provided. Now, I'm troubled by that a little bit because my mantra is always that your notice should be as wide as possible. When I say as wide as possible, I mean um, we're, we're constraining yourself as little as possible. Um, so I would choose not to issue a subclause. Obviously, if the contract says you are to issue a subclause, and that's what you must do. If it, if it doesn't, and certainly the JCT doesn't, then I would suggest you don't issue subclauses. And there's a case that back to what I'm saying that we're going to come to in a minute. So we'll come back to that. Um, so the FIDIC clause now says how it is to be delivered and that you must uh, fully disclose what the event is. Okay. So under FIDIC, uh, we have two cases to look at. One is the Abraskan case where they discovered bad ground in a tunnel being constructed between mainland Spain and uh, the airport at Gibraltar. Um, Judge Aikenhead decided that a broad interpretation uh, was required. Um, so the contractor submitted an application or, or a notice for an extension of time, um, which was seen as being late, because he didn't issue it at the time, he issued it some time later. Judge uh, Aikenhead decided that he was able to take a retrospective view and not a prospective view Prospective views are um, the, the sort of views that are required for timely notices. That's the purpose of the notice. Um, but he took the view that 
it, there wasn't necessarily going to be a delay until there was a measurable impact on the completion date, until someone could ascertain that. And that wasn't possible until the work, the additional work had actually started. So although the notice was reviewed as being late because it was issued some time after the work had started, Judge Aikenhead decided that that was entirely reasonable because that's the, only, the first time that the measurable impact could be ascertained. So the late, or what seemed to be a late EOT notice was accepted. He then, in my view, took an even broader interpretation when um, the Attorney General of Gibraltar wanted to terminate Nebraskan's employment under the contract because the contract was quite clear in saying that such a notice had to be issued to the Madrid offices of Nebraska. But what they actually did was they delivered their notice to the project manager on site. Now, Judge Aikenhead took the view here that despite the clear wording of the contract, um, the notice was effectively issued by issuing to the project manager on site because he was a senior officer within the company. So it mattered not a jot whether it was delivered to the Madrid office or to the project manager on site, it would still have the same effect. So he applied what he called a commercially realistic interpretation. So again, it depends how the judge is going to interpret the contract. Is he going to interpret it strictly or is he going to take a broad interpretation? Now, if we look at the Meida Corporation um, case from Hong Kong, Judge Chin took a very strict interpretation. The circumstances were very similar in that they, the contractor, Maida, discovered Brad Brown on a project. Now, at the time, they saw that as a variation, so they submitted a variation notice. Ultimately, the variation was not paid for and it, and it went through the courts. And Judge Chin took the view that the only mechanism for adjusting the contract sum was for bona fide variations instructed by the employer. Now, the there, were no, there was no instruction from the employer covering the bad, bad ground. So it actually wasn't a variation under the contract. It was, should have been a claim for loss and expense because there was no other mechanism to adjust the contract sum. And as they'd given a notice for a variation, they hadn't given a notice for a loss and expense claim, and they were now out of time. So their claim failed on a narrow notice, on a, on a narrow interpretation of the notice requirements. So in this instance, they had little option because they were under FIDIC and they had to state the clause. And this is one of the reasons why I said that you should take a wide, a wide view to notices if possible. And um, so certainly under the JCT, that would be the, the advice I would give. Now, if we look at the JCT, um, the first case in uh, 2010 was WW Gear against McGee. Judge Aiken had, again, the same judge. Um, he said entitlement was compromised when they failed to comply with the notice provisions. So he took a fairly narrow approach there. Whereas only two years later, in Walter Lilly versus Mackay, same judge, Judge Aikenhead, said loss and expense can be prospective or retrospective. And from this, the, the Abraskan case followed um, a couple of years later, and he was consistent with his approach there, that he could take a retrospective view and allow a later than normal notice of loss and expense. Um, so therefore, the JCT and the FIDIC can be viewed um, in, the same, in the same way. Uh, with, a, with a fairly broad approach. So the top tip here is that assume that the judge will strictly apply the notice provisions in the contract, but note above the same judge, different outcomes. Now the NEC is um, very different because time and, uh, time and money are both dealt with as compensation events, and there is an eight week period in which to advise of a compensation event under clause 61.3. Um, there aren't many cases uh, uh, under the NEC, largely because it's a relatively new contract. It's been out for a few years now in the UK. Uh, it is being used uh, in the UAE. In fact, we as a practice are working for a European contractor 
on a project in the UAE and the contract is the NEC. So it is now being seen um, over there. Um, the big issue to watch out for is the evaluation implications where there is no early warning notice. Now, there is no formal obligation to issue an early warning notice. An early warning notice is to foresee an event that might come up so it can be logged on the risk register and um, managed accordingly. Whilst there is a condition precedent clause written around the eight week notification of a compensation event, there is no condition precedent on the early warning notice, but this carries a big health warning. The compensation event will be evaluated under the normal rules of valuation if an early warning notice has been issued. However, if the early warning notice was not issued, then your compensation event will consider the situation that would have prevailed had you have issued a early warning notice. So just to simplify that, if the, if the compensation event was worth £100,000 and the early warning notice might have saved £80,000 because the employer might have been able to take alternative remedial action, um, the actual value of the compensation event would be £20,000, not the £100,000. So actually, not issuing a valid early warning notice will cost the contractor £100,000 in that instance. So that's one to watch out for. Now, the practicalities. It's really important to get these right, which is why I put it in bold. Any failings here may give an opportunity to the other party, and that's what we're trying to avoid, obviously. So who can serve a notice? Well, it's only the name of the person in the contract not necessarily the practitioner so one for you guys to watch out there i'm very well aware that quite often practitioners will issue notices on behalf of their clients we really need to make sure that we, we always go back to what the contract says and just stick to the name in the, in the contract so who should receive a notice well again it's whoever the individual is named in the contract where should the notice be served again it's the address in the contract what methods of delivery should there be? Well, post uh, is generally accepted. Um, it's not a method that I would use. Um, there are all sorts of issues with postal delivery. So you might post uh, a letter off and the contract might say, postal delivery is acceptable and deemed receipt is a phrase that they often use will be two working days after, after postage. So you'll have proof that you've posted it but how do you know whether it's been received or not? What happens if in two weeks' time you receive a return to sender letter that proves that your notice wasn't issued? Um, you're now probably out of time. So I wouldn't rely on post. Faxes on there because I still see contracts that refer to faxes. I personally haven't seen a fax in 20 years. And we as a business have had issues trying to um, serve notices by fax um which which were, were difficult to deal with and um, so i would avoid fax if possible email has its own issues um, it's an acceptable method of delivery um, and i'll come on to that because there are quite a few issues with emails um, and by far the best way is personal or courier delivery because you get proof that you do you've, you've sent it and you get proof that it's been received so the top tip here is all methods of delivery need a record of receipt. So notice delivery issues. Let's look at a few of these now. Most projects now use cloud-based information systems. So if we look at the Veranda Trust versus Icon case, um, this was where a payment, a payment notice was issued via Aconex. Um, the trust wanted to avoid making the payment, so they declared that all notices should have been issued um, to the physical address named in the contract, which was actually their solicitor's office. And the contract was unclear on capital N formal notices or lowercase n notifications. It just classed all notices as the same. And um, the Baranda Trust were, were placing reliance on the fact that it said all notices had to go to their solicitor's office. Now, 
fortunately, in this case, the judge took a fairly pragmatic uh, view and said that it was clearly impractical to issue all notices to the solicitor's office. So that should apply to legal notices, whereas the, the likes of payment notifications and applications were more practically better served um, to, to the, the, the site address or the, the address of the business. Um, so the top tip here is don't take a risk with notices. If in doubt, seek clarification. Don't leave yourself exposed as practitioners. I think ICON were pretty lucky in this case because the, the, the notice provisions were very clear. And um, I think the best advice would have been to issue two notices for each payment, uh, one to the solicitor's office or a copy to the solicitor's office, but one to the site to, to, to be actioned upon. Um, I think my advice at the start of that project would have been along the lines of let's seek a clarification and agree between the parties which notices are delivered to site and which notices need to be delivered to the physical address of the solicitor's office. Easy with hindsight though, isn't it? Notice delivery issues then. Carrying on with this, let's look at emails. I mentioned them before, that there are several issues here. So delivery failure. Um, most people's uh, PCs or laptops will have a facility to uh, provide a delivery failure notice. In actual practice, most people have these switched off now. Uh, I have myself. Um, so if you send an email, you're more than likely not going to get a delivery failure notification. So you may think the notice has gone through by email, but you don't know, you've got no certainty. Um, that's a big risk. There are routing issues as well. And there's one fairly large case where uh, uh, a notification was sent on time, but it wasn't received on time. Apparently it was received four days later. And when IT consultants inquired about this and looked into the systems, it was discovered that the, uh, the email had been routed via a data center in Oslo. Not really sure of the finer points of this, but the ISP confirmed that the email had been, the notification had been sent on time, but hadn't been received on time. It was actually four days late. There are also filtering issues, and uh, each, each, person's, um, each person's system, uh, their own system, will have filters set up to handle emails. There, there was a, 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 a project once where um, payment notification was issued to three people at the same company. Um, the email was issued in the, in the normal way, but a week later, the three individuals hadn't received the email on their screen, so they hadn't seen it. The system logged that they, the, the company had received the notification, but it wasn't an effective communication because the filter system filtered out that nobody could actually see it. So again, email delivery failed. So I've got a question here, and that is who holds the risk if both parties agree to email delivery? Uh, and I don't know the answer. Um, I, I suspect the answer is um, the person sending the email because you need to be able to prove, you're going to assert that you've issued a notice validly. You need to be able to prove that you've done so. Um, and without proof, you, 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 you will fail. So the top tip here is whatever method of delivery you must have a receipt. So the UK Construction Act calls for a service of a notice by any effective means. Now, this is a bit of a, a brain teaser, really, just for a bit of fun. The question is, is the term means meant generically to refer to any a means of delivery, such as a recorded or hand delivery or email? Or does effective means refer literally to the effective service in each case? Now, my interpretation of this is that any means can only be deemed to be effective if it is evidenced by a record of receipt. So I think effective means may, means where you have proof of delivery. So I guess what I'm saying there, regardless of what it says in the contract about delivery, you must have proof of delivery. Let's just run through the top tips that I've talked through. And we've got 
capital N notice or lowercase n notice stroke notification may still be drafted as a condition precedent. Don't forget that they can still be noted conditions precedent. Condition precedent clause does not need to state it is a condition precedent, it just needs to satisfy the three point Bremer Handbook test. Clearly, state communication is a notice in bold capitals in the title and make your notice look something other than just another communication or another letter. Comply with every requirement of a notice clause. So go back to what it says in the contract and stick to that. Assume that the judge will strictly apply any notice provisions. All methods of delivery need a record of receipt. If in doubt, seek clarification. Don't take a risk with notices. Just to add a few points to that, I would say err on the side of caution. As a practitioner, people are relying on our advice. We need to err on the side of caution. I would keep your notice as wide as possible to so only state clauses if you if you really must. Think of the Maeda case. It's under FIDIC, you need to state a clause, so you've, you've got little latitude with that. It's under the JCT, you generally don't need to state a clause. It could be amended, but I would keep your notice as wide as possible, and I would make your claim as narrow as possible. So be very specific in your claim. And the reason here is, you get no opportunity to change your notice. So if you quote the wrong clause or there's a typo error, you've in fact not issued your notice properly. If you issue a claim with the wrong notice clause or there's a typo, you can reissue your claim. The claims will generally not be time barred once they've been submitted. Starting point for everything is what's written in the contract. And the final piece of advice is spend your time and energy complying with the contract not trying to justify any non-compliance. Now, there are guidance and templates, which Nina mentioned early on the ICCP website, but remember, the judge will consider the natural meaning and construction of the contract. So a template will not be a one-size-fits-all solution for every single event. By all means, take the templates and use them, but go back to what the contract says, and you might need to tweak the templates to suit the particular circumstances of your case. That is the end of my webinar. So thank you for everyone who's joined today. And Nina, I'll pass back to yourself. Okay, we have a question from Maxim. Um, it's a long one, so I hope I communicate it well. Um, it might be a short so answer though. <laughs> Uh, okay, C could you please give your opinion on a situation under the project in a civil law country where both parties have not followed contractual time bars for the notice delivery during a year and a half of the project and later on one where the employer wished to decline a notice to extension of time based on the fact that, that it was not provided within 28 days uh, time bar period, which is, is under FIDIC, uh, condition of FIDIC 1999. Would that be treated as a valid notice? So what we're saying is if it's outside the 28 day period, is it regarded as a valid notice? Um, on, on the facts of what I've heard there, I would say no, it isn't. But I, but I think we need to go back to um, could it be viewed retrospectively? That what that the, the the key point is what is the trigger point for the 28-day notice? And as a practitioner, I think your task is to try and identify a plausible reason why um, the event couldn't be measurable um, prior to the notice being issued. Uh, it may be that that's not possible and that, that, that it actually is time barred. Um, I, I would need to know a bit more about the actual circumstances, but if, if um, the person asking the question wants to email me a bit more information, I'm quite happy to, to provide a bit of uh, pro, bon pro bono advice if, if that's uh, appropriate. Okay, thank you, Bill. I'll drop, uh, Maxim, I'll just share Bill's email address with you if, if you'd like to get in touch with Bill separately. Um, okay, we have another question from uh, Shimilis, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, is notice with a capital N 
uh, delivery by email accepted all over the world or does it depend from country to country? Um, I think it's generally accepted all over the world. Again, we have to go back to what it says in the contract and also go back to a word of caution. I personally would not rely on issuing a notice by email for the reasons said in the, in the webinar. But I think it is generally, even, even where the contract says a notice has to be written, uh, an email is generally regarded as a written um, document. So, so yes is the answer to the first question, but it comes with a caution. Okay, um, right, we do have somebody that would like to ask a question live on the session. So, um, Shahram, I'm just going to unmute your microphone if you'd like to ask your question live. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you, Mr. B. Actually, oh, uh, I have, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yes. yes. Actually, the, uh, suppose the, the situation, for example, according to any 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 kind of contracts, for example, the FIDIC or JCT or NEC, for example, you are going to uh, send your uh, uh, initial notices and maybe without the very detailed supporting documents, but maybe you will, uh, I mean, announce the cost impact and time impact as well. And uh, during the time, according to the contract uh, framework, you are you, you have to submit your actually your support document in the I mean in the required time. But uh, during the preparation of this I mean this material to send to to the engineer or to the client, maybe uh, you uh, at the for the same send for the same case. You will, according to the progressive elaboration, you will understand that the time impact and cost impact is higher than the first or in the initial uh, forecast. Okay. In during this time, you have to send, uh, I mean, uh, a separate uh, notice, or uh, it is it is okay that you already you have the you have the you have sent the, the initial one. And it will be valid or it will be invalid. Uh, uh, could I explain my 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 idea? Yes. Okay. So I, th I think I think I've picked up what you're saying is that um, an event occurs, so you issue a notice and you estimate the time and the cost in or, or the impact of that notice. But events change or it develops, and actually the impact becomes much worse than what you first envisaged. And therefore, do you need to submit a secondary notice, or do you just update the first notice? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think the answer to that is uh, err on the side of caution. That's what I always say. I would submit uh, an update to the first notice, and I may, depending on the circumstances, I may even submit a secondary notice as well. Um, I take the view that I would rather have more notices than less notices because they do, they can trip you up. Um, and I'm going to become a cynic now. Some people do write the notice provisions to trip contractors up. Um, so erring on the side of caution is, is the best way. But there is nothing wrong with updating the data in a notice. There's nothing, nothing, well, generally nothing in the contract. You would have, yours might be specific and different. But generally, there's nothing that says you can't update a notice, um, and it is, it's, you know, it has to be uh, envisaged that data will change. You know, you, you, at the time you issue the notice, because you, you're required to issue the, issue the notice very early, you won't have final information at that stage. But it has to be contemplated that that may well change. The point is that you've issued a notice. And you've given the other opportunity, given the other party an opportunity to take preventative remedial action. I see. I see. Thank you very much for your uh, clear explanation. I got. I got okay. your point. Thank you. We have a question from um, Abhishek on an EPC lump sum contract. If the notice for liquidated damages is not sent before the contract completion. Can the delay in serving a notice be seen as deemed to be an extension of time to the contractor? 
I'll have a think about this one after the webinar. This is an interesting question, but uh, my, my initial response is no, I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure that I really relate the timing of the issue of a notice um, regarding damages to um, the extension of time. And, and also, I think there's a bit of an issue um, about the issuance of the notice of liquidated damages before practical completion has been achieved, because um, uh, who, who knows or who can be certain when, when the project's going to complete. Um, let me let me buy a little time to think about that one, and uh, I'll respond to the person who's asked the question uh, later today. Okay, thanks, Dale. Um, we've, we've got probably a handful of other questions. So what we'll do, we'll, we'll com, com, uh, compile written responses to those, and, and we'll share them. Um, we have a page on the ICCP website where all the recordings, presentations, um, and, and written Q and A is hosted. So uh, those will go up. Um, but within about a week or so after today, so, uh, we'll make sure that you do get responses to your questions. I'd just like to say thank you for joining us. I hope you found today's session valuable. Um, I hope it's been a positive introduction to the ICCP if you didn't know about us already. Thank you everybody for joining and thank you very much Bill for presenting.